All right, welcome to the uh, critical uh, lab lecture today. So today, basically, we'll run through all of what you need to know for the second part of experiment 17, including the NMR like analysis of 17. Okay, so that's the important part. And as soon as I start talking, that register starts going. So I apologize to those of you watching at home because you can hear that more than you can hear me. But all right, that's why you should be here. Okay, <laughs> for the rest of you who did make it. All right, here we're talking about what we're going to do this week. Okay, a couple of uh, just heads up. This week, don't forget, experiment 18 report is due. So hopefully you've all got your unknowns identified and your uh, reports all put together, your spectra printed out, and everything in a nice little bundle and ready to go. Okay, if you have any questions on that, let me know. Experiment 16 worksheets are due as well. I fielded a lot of questions about splitting today. So those of you who are putting it off because it's not due till Thursday, take a look sooner rather than later. All right, and hopefully SDBS will remain up. So it is up and working. It's been working just fine like normal today. So you can uh, you can get those actual literature values from that off of SDBS. Yeah. All right, and so today here's the game plan for today: the second half of Experiment 17 and NMR interpretation. Looking ahead a little bit, next week then we're going to go into Experiment 20 Part A. So. I don't know, experiment 19 just never existed or whatever else. We're on to 20. And then we end up with 20 A, B, and C, and then that's it. So that sweet taste of the end of the semester is already there. All right, but don't get too excited because there's a lot of stuff to do between now and then. All right, so just to remind you of where we are. Last week, everybody ran a bidding reaction with these two reagents. We ended up with that product, hopefully in some state of purity that you can tell by your TLC. Now really we, we precipitated a good share of that triphenylphosphine oxide out of there, but now we're left with a little bit of that is left. You might have some byproducts in there, you might have a little bit of starting material. Our goal for this week is twofold. One is to purify those products, and we'll do that via col column chromatography. Okay, so I'll describe what that is and how that works here in just a couple minutes. Then at the end of the, of the lab this week, you'll end up with an NMR sample. Okay, we'll run those, you will process them, and you will analyze it, and you will be able to say how pure your spectrum is, what mixture of products you have, and so on. Okay, and so we'll talk about that. But where we're at is we have both of these present plus a few byproducts that we want to get rid of. All right, so where are we going to start? Just a couple of highlights on TLC. We all did TLC last week. So hopefully you kind of remember the basics you may have forgotten, okay? But just as a quick little recap, hopefully if everything was wonderful and nice, you had a TLC plate that looked like this. Nobody in my lab did. They're a lot busier than that, and that's okay. All right, but this is the general idea. You have a starting material standard. You have a product standard. You put your mixture in the middle. Okay, I've got the mixture of both of those species present. Okay. All right, some of, the, some of the, uh, the basics. Remember that that plate is covered with silica gel. Okay, that's what we refer to as the stationary phase quite often. That's the stage that doesn't move, right? It's stuck to the silica gel or to the plate. Okay, that's a polar uh, medium. All right, and you can see we also that like the lab manual refers to that as the, as the absorbent as well. Okay, so that's again that's the silica gel. What's on the plate? Okay, then we move a solvent over the top of that. The solvent is often referred to as the mobile phase since it's the one that mo that's moving. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. It's also referred to as the eluent, okay? And ultimately, that's what's responsible for pulling those compounds off the plate and moving them up the plate, okay? A couple of highlights in there, right? We've got the origin down there where you just dotted things to start, the solvent front, that's how far it went up the plate when you developed it. Hopefully, you remember to mark that with a pencil so then you can determine what your RF is, okay? And you all did this this week, so that's all. Um, hopefully, you remember that, otherwise it's too late. Okay, but ultimately, okay, we look at how far the compounds move. Okay, how does the polarity of the solvent, polarity of effect, how will the polar, polarity of solvent affect the RF of the compound? If I use a more polar compound, what's it going to do to the RF of my compounds? Okay, it's going to increase it. A more polar solvent basically has more pulling power. It's going to pull things farther up the plate. Okay, another way to think about it is if I use a, if I use one set of solvents. I have two species here. The more polar one isn't going to travel as far. It's going to stick to the plate tight, more tightly. Okay? The things that are less polar, the more non-polar compounds, will travel up the plate and have higher RFs. Okay? So we remember those. Okay? And in general, here's the idea. The more polar compound, what I 
the spot on the plate will have greater, it'll stick to the plate more. Okay, solvent's got more eluding power, we'll pull those out. Okay, in general, things like hexane, okay, just like carbon chains, are non-polar solvents. If we want to get really polar solvents, you go to things like alcohols. Okay, and those will just like rip compounds off that silica gel and move them off the plate. Just sort of general, you know, these are all the same things we talked about last semester. Good to kind of remember them. And then what we use in lab and what we did last semester and what we'll use uh, this week is that we use a hexane ethyl acetate mixture. So hexane is very nonpolar, ethyl acetate is moderately polar. And then what's nice is we could readily tune this, right? So you could have a four to one hexane ethyl acetate mixture, and if that's not quite polar enough, you can change it to one to one. Or, so you can change the ratio of those two compounds. Okay. I would say, like for example, in my research lab, we probably use these two compounds, hexane ethyl acetate mixtures, for about 95% of the like, TLCs in the columns that we run. So this is really a common solvent. All right, so what is the column chromatography? Okay, so ultimately it's very, very closely related to TLC. You all know everything you need to know about TLC already, about how that works and what I just ran through. Okay, and so we use those same concepts for column chromatography. Okay, again, the idea is it's pretty much, if you think about it, like a big three dimensional TLC plane. Okay, that can really help you think about how the process works, how we separate things. Okay, and it separates them both based on polarity. Same idea as with the TLC. More polar compounds move more slowly. Less polar compounds move more quickly. Okay. All right, so we think about taking our TLC plate like this and flipping it over. Okay, so you take it and you flip it over. So now our origin's up at the top and compounds are eluding downward. That's essentially what's happen happening in the column chromatography. Okay, we put our starting materials up here at the top and we let them elute downward. So the ones that have higher RFs on your original plate are the ones that come out faster, that come out first, and then the ones that's, that have a lower RF that stick more tightly take longer to come out the column. Okay. Some things you'll note about the columns that we'll be using, this is at least a vague, you know, an artist rendition of what you're using in, uh, in lab this week. Okay. They're going to be relatively small columns, but have these general ideas to it. So first of all, there's a stopcock down at the bottom that will control the flow. You open it or close it. The next part is a fritted disc that's right down here on the bottom. And we use that, that when we fill this with silica gel, it doesn't all run out the bottom. It's a helpful thing to have. So, right? This next part is the stationary phase. So we will use silica gel. Okay, so now instead of being pre-stuck on a TLC plate, we actually have free-flowing silica gel that we will pour into the column. Okay, and that will be our stationary phase. Again, held in there because of the really convenient for the disc that's in the bottom of the column. Okay, and so going on, what you ultimately you do is I'll tell you, I'll walk through the process and how we how we do this, but you put your mixture to be separated right on top of the silica gel. Okay, then on top of that we have solvent up here. Okay? And ultimately we run that solvent through and we separate our columns as they come up. Alright, how does this work? Okay? As I mentioned before, as the solvent passes through the column, the things that are more polar travel more slowly. The things that are less polar travel more quickly. Okay? So I work really hard on this animation, so you've got to pay attention. Okay? Both my I put my mixture of compounds right there on the top. Okay? Now as I start pushing solvent through the system, okay, nonpolar will go fast, polar will go slow, and they separate as they go down the column. No. Okay? <laughs> this red one down here is the less polar of the two. Okay, the blue one's more polar. It's so awesome, we'll see it again. Okay? <laughs> so you note how one travels through more quickly as the solvent goes down the column. The other sticks. Okay? As a result, they separate from one another. And as you're collecting things that come out the bottom, okay, first you end up with just solvent that comes through. Okay? Then you come, this red thing comes through, and if you keep on going, okay, the blue one comes down and you can separate the compounds that way. So by changing the collection vial at the bottom, okay, you get the ones that travel fastest first, then, if you're lucky, you have a gap where you get just solvent again, and then you get your second compound and so on. Okay? And that's if it works the way it's supposed to. Okay? All right. And again, I've already emphasized that a lot. The less polar compounds, the ones that went that had the higher spots on your TLC plate, those come through first. And then the ones that stick with the low, R, low RF, those come through second. Okay? All right. And then ultimately, as I mentioned, what we'll do is we'll collect our fractions and vials. Okay? And then by separating those vials as they come through, 
what we'll find is hopefully we'll separate. The okay, fastest ones will be in the first ones we collect, and then the slower moving compounds will be in the later ones that we collect. All right, questions about the general idea on how this works and how those compounds get separated based on polarity, okay? and then the relationship to the TLC. Okay, those are all kind of the major points to get at this stage. We good so far? Yeah. Is there any way to alter like the speed of how it eludes, how the compounds elude? Yes. How could you change? How could you get compounds to elude faster? To not use as much solvent to push them through? Okay, more polar solvent. If you use a more polar solvent, the solvents come through with less solvent pushing them. Right? If you use a non-polar solvent, so if you use, say, more hexane, they'll hang on there longer and you're going to have to put more volume of solvent through there. Okay? Good question. All right. I kind of like to think about it sometimes, how I mentioned you flip over the TLC plate. And think about you just keep on adding solvent to the top. And so you know how you get the RF. If you keep on adding solvent, eventually those spots will continue to go until they're all the way up at the top. That's kind of what you're doing with the TLC plate. Or with the, sorry, with the column. Just doing it upside down. You keep on adding solvent to it, and eventually those spots will get all the way to the bottom. Right? That's what's happening with the, with the column chromatography. All right. Okay, so some nuts and bolts. This is, this is detailed in your lab manual here, so don't feel like you have to scratch down all these notes. I just want to kind of put out a couple of highlights on things to look out for and things that will help you out. Okay? First things first, test your column. Okay, so you'll get a column. We're gonna have a, we have a whole bunch of little plastic columns there. So you get it, you'll set it, you'll hook it up on a clamp. First thing to do is put in just a little squirt of acetone, right? You got the acetone bottle. Fill it up, maybe a milliliter or two, and open up the stock cock on the bottom, okay? You better get solvent coming through. If you don't, it's gonna be a really, really long day, right? You're not gonna get any solvent through, and you aren't gonna get any compounds through, okay? So just check to make sure it's not plugged somehow. Especially those of you who, I mean, tomorrow morning, you, they're all nice and clean and ready to be used for you, okay? Tuesday afternoon, we have to reuse some of the columns, and so the bozos in the Tuesday morning section may ruin it for you, okay? So just be sure that it, it blows. It'll be fine, but just check. If you don't check, that's when you have the problems. All right, the next thing is we have to actually add the silica gel. Okay, how we do that? Okay, we're gonna measure out five or six grams of silica gel. What silica gel is, it kind of has the consistency of very, very, very fine sand. Well, really, it kind of is very, very, very fine sand, okay? And as a result, if you kind of throw it around a little bit, it can become airborne, okay? And it itself has no, like, bad chemical effects with you, but that little tiny airborne particles, breathing them in can be a bad, bad thing, okay? So just be careful with the silica gel, okay? Don't be throwing it around and splashing around. Just be careful as you measure it out. Okay, nicely, if there's any spills, let us know. We'll clean those up, okay? And, you know, whatever you do, don't, you know, smell it, okay? Don't take a big old, you know, whiff of it, all right? So I know it, it can be tempting, but don't do it, all right? Okay, you measured up five or six grams of silica gel, and then what we'll do, do this in a, in a small beaker, add about 20 mils of the eluent, the four to one hexane ethyl acetate, and then you make a slurry. What you want to do is just swirl that around and get it so it's at least relatively free-flowing, free okay? So you can pour the mixture. Then what you'll do, once you've got that kind of moving pretty well, you'll take that mixture and you'll pour it into your column, okay? You pour the slurry into the column, okay? you'll have, what you'll see is you'll get a bunch of the silica gel down here on the bottom and you'll have some of the excess solvent on the top. And you'll, what you want to do is open up the stopcock on the bottom and that'll compress everything downward. Okay. It'll compress the silica down here on the bottom okay, as it's pushing the solvent through. Okay. Use additional solvent. So you'll get this stuff, will, it's kind of like, you know, almost like making mud pies in some sense. You'll have some just sort of sitting around on your beaker. Take a little more solvent, add it in there, swirl it around, get all of that five to six grams of silica gel into the, um, into the column. Okay. And what you'll see is as you, as you lower this solvent level, so as it drips out through the bottom, the solvent level will decrease. Eventually, you'll see the silica gel will compress like this. It'll start out looking like it's this much, and then as you continue to pull solvent through, it all kind of settles down into a nice layer, okay? And so you'll see it compress like this. One of the keys is, is you want to stop it as soon as that solvent gets to the top of the silica gel layer, okay? So you see how right here, the this, this solvent is right at the same level as the top of the silica gel, okay? You don't want to let that solvent layer drop below the top of the silica gel. What happens if that salt, if you, if you continue to run solvent through, what happens is your silica gel dries out. You can get like little cracks that go through the body of the silica gel. And now basically that's like little expressways for your molecule, right? The solvent will go through there 
and the stuff that's on the sides of the silica gel, you know, it'll, it, the solvent won't go over there and you'll get this uneven distribution and it can wreck your whole column. Okay? So that's one of the key things is don't let the solvent layer drop below the top of the silica gel. Okay, so there'll be a number of times you'll add solvent, you'll pull it down, you'll add some more solvent, it'll go down, and just make sure that it doesn't get below the top. All right, questions so far? Okay, all of this so far is simply to prep the column. Okay, at this point we haven't put our compound on yet. So this is effectively like making the TLC plate, if you want to think about it that way. Okay, so now we have all of our silica gel in there, it's wet with solvent, but it's all you know, compressed down. Now we actually add our compound. Okay. What you'll want to do is dissolve your crude product in just a couple of milliliters of 4 to 1 hexanethyl acetate. This is one of the cases that the less solvent that you use to dissolve it, the better. And the reason is, is that when we put that on the column, the less solvent that you use is like the less of a layer of your material you put in there. And the perfect column has just like a pencil thin layer of material that you're separating. Keep in mind, if it all starts in the same place, it's more likely to separate nicely as it goes through the column. If you have a big, thick layer of material to start, it's going to be harder to separate. Okay? So you want to use as little of, of solvent as you can to add that on. Okay? And so then what happens is using a pipette, you drip it right onto the top of your silica gel. Okay? So I'll drip it right on there. The, sol the stuff will come right there. There'll be a little solvent on top. Then what I do is I go ahead and drain that again. So I open up the stopcock on the bottom until the solvent level is right on top of the silica gel again. And I'll do this a couple of times. Put in a milliliter or two of solvent, just a little bit, and then drain to the top of the column. Add in a little bit more, drain to the top of the column. What this does is it gets all of your compound nicely adhered to the silica gel. Okay? So it all gets stuck onto the silica gel. It might start coming down a little bit there. Okay? And do that a couple of times. Yeah, and the set there, make sure it's attached to the silica gel. And then finally, you've got that all nicely attached. That's essentially the point where you're spotting your compound on your TLC plate. Then what you do is you go ahead and fill it up now with solvent. Okay? Once you fill it up with solvent, you're ready to go. You can just open up that stopcock on the bottom and then collect vials full of your uh, of the LU as it comes through the column. Okay? And the, the game plan we're doing is we say use the small vials typically. You fill those about halfway full, okay? Four mils per vial. It doesn't matter exactly what you do, okay? But that's kind of a game plan. Typically, we'll use probably 10 vials is about right for these columns. And it can vary a little bit depending on how much silica gel you use and things like that, okay? All right. One thing to keep in mind as you have this open and the stuff is dripping through and you're collecting it in the vials, just be sure that that solvent layer doesn't get down past the top again, you just go ahead and add more solvent if you need to, to keep on pushing it through. All right, questions on that? Okay, hopefully that'll be pretty straightforward. How do you actually know when you've got your material? Before we do that, yes? So we'll transfer all of our crude product in one pipette, or yes. transfer some? Yep, you want to dissolve all of your crude product in like one, you know, a couple extra milliliters of um, hexanethyl acetate. If you do a couple mils, you probably need a couple pipette poles. But yeah, you want to do it all at once. And then put that on, and then do the extra couple mils of just solvent after that to get it attached to the top. Other questions? All right, so unlike my nifty little uh, you know, animation earlier, the compounds that are coming off this column are not you know, blue and red or something that's easy to see. They're all, because this is an organic lab, they're all colorless compounds. Okay? How do we know when they're actually coming off? And that's why we now we turn to TLC and the behavior of the compounds. So what we do, okay, first, so we don't have to run TLC plates of absolutely everything that we do, is we look at these based on what we call the grid method. Okay, so just you grab a TLC plate and make it into some boxes like this. Okay, and so basically what I've done here, separated the boxes, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, all the way along. What those boxes now correspond to is which fraction that I've taken off the column. Okay, so I'll take the first fraction, take a spotter, put a couple dots in the first box. Okay, take the second fraction that came off, put it in the second box, third and fourth and so on. Okay, one tip, you don't need new TLC spotters for every single one. Okay, a great little way to do this is just to use the TLC spotter once, dip it in a tiny bit of acetone, and then onto a paper towel. Okay, that'll clean it off pretty well, and then you can use that same TLC spotter again. Okay, so those of you who fear the Bunsen burner and the glass blowing part, okay, you only have to do it once. Okay. 
All right, once you have them on there, you still can't see anything, right? How are we going to visualize whether we have something there or not? Okay, UV. Okay, we'll look at, we'll put it into the box, we'll turn on the UV light, and then we'll see spots, something like this. Okay. And so basically what this tells us is there is nothing that is UV active here or here, and now we start seeing UV active species there, and then you can see it's kind of fading out, and then I don't see anything. Okay. So what this means is there's something UV active between <coughs> three, you know, three through nine. Okay. Are these our product? Possibly, maybe. Other things that are in there that are UV active, okay, the triphenylphosphine oxide can be UV active. Anything that has an aromatic ring, the starting material can be UV active. Okay, so ultimately, this just tells us that there is something UV active in each of these fractions. Okay. All right. So then, what you do is you take each one where you saw something here, and then you have to run it off a TLC plate to see exactly what it is that's in that fraction. Okay. All right. I would suggest trying to see if you can't get three or four dots on each plate. Plate, and then put the product standard in the middle. That's typically what I'll do. So I'll do like fractions, you know, three and four, a standard in the middle, and then and then uh, five and six. That way, if the plate kind of goes a little kitty wampus sometimes, it kind of goes one side goes up or whatever. Then that way you can sort of figure out where that standard is in the middle. Okay. These look pretty nice. Okay. What's going to happen is these UV active species. Okay. So I have like three and four. Look at these. If you get a plate like this, man, it's worth a million bucks. Okay. But chem draw, it comes out this way pretty easily. All right, and so these are the spots that you see in your plate. Okay, take note of what's in these. Okay, so note that I have my product standard in the middle, and so that's my product right there. Okay, so this first one is pure, but it's got some other compound in it. Okay, discard it. Okay, or these, you know, separate it. Okay, this four, number four comes out, note that it's got two things in there, right? So it's an impure fraction. It has some product in there, but there's some impure fraction in there. Okay? And then now my standard, note that five, man, I spotted it a little hard, so it's streaky, but it's, it's the product, okay? It's at the same RF right there on the top, it's pretty much the same, okay? Six is pretty much the same. So now it looks like five and six have pure product. Okay? If I keep on going over here, seven, eh, it's got a little tail on it, it's a little bit lower than these, okay? But common sense tells you that if this was pure and this is pure, the one in the middle has to be pure, okay? So all of those are the same. And there's my standard again. And now I have something else coming off down here. So note that it's a lot lower RF, so that's something separate. What's really the key is here is you want to take the ones that are pure and combine them. Okay? Don't add something. If you go ahead and take one of these and combine them, you've basically undone the entire process of the column. Okay? So be sure you're pretty selective in taking the pure things and putting them together. One thing I'll note, just a big asterisk for those of you really taking notes on this, is that this is an artist's rendition of a different system. Your system, what's the product? In terms of the spots on the plate, is it the high spots or the low spots? It's the high spots, okay? So it's kind of opposite of what I've drawn up here. So your product is the top two spots, the cis and trans isomers, and then the starting material is a little lower than that, okay? So that's the, the importance of using the standard in the middle and not trusting some artist's rendition that Johnson threw up on the board, okay? So be sure you look at your standards. All right, and then moving forward, in this case, I would combine fractions five and six and seven and eight, and I, I would put all those together. Okay, I'd rotovap them with our new friend, the rotovap. Okay, then what we'll do is put it on high vac. Your profs will show you how to do that this week. What that is is it's an even, it's a higher vacuum that we can hook that up to that is going to dry it off even better, get all that extra solvent and things off of your sample. Because then what we're going to do is make an NMR sample and go from there. If you don't dry this really, really well you're going to see the residual solvent, a little bit of hexane, a little bit of ethyl acetate in your NMR. Okay, the NMR is crazy enough already. We don't want that extra stuff in there. So you put it on the high vac for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. That'll get rid of most of that solvent. Okay, we'll prepare the NMR sample in lab. Your process will run it probably right after the lab, and then you get to process it. Okay, one, thing, one suggestion, process it sooner rather than later. If you wait until two weeks from now to do it, you're not going to remember anything that I'm going to say in the next 15 or 20 minutes. So. Do that sooner rather than later, if at all possible. All right, questions with the separation process, how the column works, anything like that? All right, either I'm doing a really good job or you guys are all sleeping. So either way, I'm going to keep on going. Okay. Yes, Professor Fu. How do you dispose of the silicon gel? 
Ah, that's a great question. So dispose of the silica gel, what you do is you keep that uh, stock tract open and drain off as much solvent as you can. Okay, then the excess solvent that you don't use in some of these, okay, that goes into the organic waste. The silica gel, then what we'll do is we'll have those columns kind of just let them sit there for a while and dry out. There will be a bucket in one of the front hoods that's specifically labeled silica gel waste. Okay, so you'll bring it on over to one of those front hoods, tap out as much of it as you can, and then there'll be a bucket there to put the used um, columns in. Okay, so we'll get rid of all that silica gel, clean those out, and then we'll have them ready for the next lab section. All right, other questions? All right, onward we go. Okay, so you process that NMR on your own. Once you've done this experiment, okay, now you'll have hopefully a NMR spectrum that shows you only these two compounds. These are the two possible compounds, the cis and the trans alkene of the bidding product. How are these two structures going to differ from one another? Okay, if we look at them on NMR, how are they going to be different? Okay. Ultimately, they both have a methyl ester, they both have an aromatic ring. The only area where they differ is around the double bonds. Okay? And so based on what you've hopefully all done already with experiment 16, how do cis and trans alkenes differ? All right, at least a couple of people have done this. Way to go. The coupling constants are going to be different. Okay, so two things that will be slightly different. Okay, chemical shift is going to be slightly different. Okay, so we go through the process, uh, and I'll show you this in a second, of calculating, predicting those chemical shifts. Okay, having a cis and a trans alkene will give you slightly different chemical shifts around that alkene. Okay, the splitting between cis and trans will be different. That coupling constant. It will be different. And I'll kind of walk through how those are different here um, in the next few minutes. All right. Keep in mind that the primary differences here are going to be around this double bond. Once you get out here to this aromatic ring that's two and three bonds removed from that alkene, there's not going to be much of a difference. Okay, I'll kind of show you what you can expect, but pretty much those are going to be the same. The focus is really going to be at the alkene itself. All right. Okay, if we predict the chemical shift, how would we go about predicting the chemical shift of these two? Okay, first of all, what's the rough area in an uh, NMR spectrum where you can expect vinyl peaks like this with the hydrogens directly connected to the double bond? What's a rough chemical shift? Okay, I heard five, I heard six. Great, in that region, perfect. How are we gonna predict one a little bit more accurately than that, or a little bit more specifically? We can use the same process that we did uh, in experiment 16 and look at those tables and that, those can help us out. Okay, so if you look at lab manual page 16-11, this is how you can calculate those chemical shifts. Okay. All right, and so now just as a quick little description, here's the base number, that five and a quarter. Okay, and say for example I'm looking at HA, the alkene has three separate substituents. Okay, the geminal is the one that's on the same carbon, so in this case it would be that ester. The cis is the one that's cis to it, so it would be this phenethyl group. And then the trans, the HA, is HB. Okay, so you can use each of those three things. We know how to look things up in the table now. You punch them all together, you can all add up three numbers. Okay, and so now I'm gonna go through and just tell you what these are gonna be. Okay, you can go through HA, trans, and I will give you the hint. All of these slides are up on Moodle, so you can feverishly scratch them down right now, or you can pull them up in the comfort of your dorm room later on this evening, okay? All right, so the predicted shift of HA trans, so right here, is 5.84. Okay, if you do the same thing for the rest of them, I'm gonna just go ahead and put them in there. HB trans, note that it's 6.84. Okay, so note the two ends of that alkene are pretty significantly different, right? It's predicted to be one part per million, different between the two of them, okay? We do the same sort of analysis for the cis. Okay, HA is predicted to be at 5.8. Okay, note that the two HAs are very, very similar. Okay, but then the HB is six and a quarter, 6.25. And note that that one is pretty different, right? There's a significant difference between those two. Okay, so using that information, hopefully we can tell the difference of which ones, you know, which protons belong to the cis alkene and which ones belong to the trans. All right? Okay, so using that information, the other thing we're going to do is look at the coupling that we expect for each of these. Okay, so I know that this is kind of given uh, several of you fits over the course of the last couple of days. And so we'll just kind of give a quick little idea on how we figure this out. All right, if I'm looking at HA on this, what coupling can I expect? Okay, I can expect the trans coupling across here with HB. 
but I can also expect a little bit of coupling with these allylic hydrogens that are right there. So that CH2, because this is a rigid system, okay, that H2 is going to give us a small coupling constant. Do you remember what those coupling constants are? If you don't, check that out. I'm glad those of you who do, good job. Okay? If you don't, check out the table on page 16-14. That'll tell you what they are. Okay? As a reminder, the trans coupling is 12 to 18 hertz. The allylic coupling uh, to here, that's only 0 to 3. Okay? It's pretty small. I will tell you in this, I'll show you actually what coupling you'll, you should kind of expect in your NMR here in a couple minutes, but we should be able to see it. Okay? It's about 1 and a half, I think, uh, in these examples. All right. And so what's that going to look like? Okay, The splitting pattern is going to look like this. Okay, so several of you have had this question, how do you figure this out? We have one proton that's trans that's going to make a big coupling constant that's somewhere in that order of you know, 15 hertz wide. So it'll be a nice big one. Then there's two hydrogens over here that are allylic to that HA. Each of those are going to split in that 0 to 3 range. And so you'll make two little triplets that if you measure the distance between the peaks, it's going to be somewhere between 0 and 3 hertz. Okay, so one big one, and then a two, you know, and then triplets. Okay, a pair of little triplets. So if we look at it, it's going to give a, a, a spectrum that looks kind of like this. A triplet here and a triplet here, okay, that are quite a distance apart. Okay, I'll, see, I'll show you what the actual data looks like here in a couple of minutes. Okay, but that's the way that you do these uh, in, the, in experiment 16. Everything is just doublets of doublets. It's about as complicated as it gets. In this case, we have one big doublet, okay, and then a smaller triplet, okay, because of these two allylic hydrogens. Okay. Does everybody follow that? Anybody have any questions? You always draw the larger um, first. It makes it easier if you do it. You don't have to. If you if you measure out the actual values, you can do the triplet first and then make it into a big doublet. You'll get the exact same pattern. Okay, it's just that all the lines start crossing and then it gets a little messy. So it's easiest to do the big one first. All right, any other questions? OK. All right, and if we look at the rest of these, HB is a little bit different. We still have the big trans coupling there, but now we have that kind of standard three bond coupling between HB and then the two allylic hydrogens here. Okay, So we have trans, and then we have that what's called a vicinal, so that's just the three bond coupling that's kind of medium size. And we're going to get a peak that looks like that. Okay, Again, it's going to be two triplets, but now those little triplets are going to be bigger than the little tiny triplets we had here. Okay. Now if we do the same prediction on this one. Okay, same general idea, except now the cis coupling instead of the trans is smaller. So it's not quite as wide here. Okay. And so you're going to get two triplets in this case. And then finally, for HB, you're going to have the cis coupling that's going to be on the order of 10 hertz. And then this one, this triplet, will actually cause an overlap like this. So it gives you a little bit of a headache. Okay? Where the first one is a doublet, but then now this triplet from each of these ends up overlapping a little bit. Okay? So they can get a little bit messy. You end up with those triplets that start overlapping. Okay? And I'll show you what that looks like here in a second. All right. Here's what the spectrum looks like, the whole shebang. Okay? All right. Some little tips in terms of as you, as you print these out and things like that. Be sure you get that spectrum level up a little bit so you can read all the integrations and things like that. I've got extra peaks in here. We're going to zoom in on each one as we go. Okay? First thing to look at, though, briefly, is if we look at these alkene peaks that I was really interested in. Okay? There's an alkene peak right there, right about 7. Okay? That matches pretty well with the 6.8. Okay? There's another one here about 6 and a quarter, which matches pretty darn well with 6 and a quarter. Okay, and then we have these two that are really close to each other, which match up pretty nicely with the two that are about 5.8. So if I assign each of those, okay, that's going to be our HB trans. So this one right up there. That one will be the HB cis right there. And then those other two are kind of right next to each other. Okay? All right. And this is far too, you know, far out to look at, any, at anything in detail. So what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on the HB cis and HB trans. Okay? All right. So now we zoomed in. This is what it looks like. All right. And so now what we want to figure out is, is you know, how do we get information from these and so on. So remember how we kind of predicted we were going to get two triplets, double to triplets for these. Okay. And if I look at what we thought, sorry, that's a little bit faint, 
this is the this is the coupling patterns that we predicted for HB trans. So for this one, okay, the wide coupling first, and then the triplet from those two over here. So this this one couple. Okay, you can see that that matches pretty well, right? There's our three. There's our three. It matches that set. Okay, so it looks like that's that kind of affirms the fact that yes, that is our HB trans. Okay. Note that this HB cis is a little bit more confusing because we had that overlap in there. Sorry that these are kind of sitting over the top of each other. Okay, that overlap. That's why if you look at this one, this doesn't look, see how this one looks like two triplets nicely sitting next to each other? And this one over here looks like two triplets, but it looks kind of funny in the middle. Okay. The reason is, is that each triplet here, this triplet is the first peak, the second peak, and the fourth peak here is actually one triplet. And then the third peak and the fifth and the sixth are the other one. Okay, so they're slightly overlapping a little bit. That's why it ends up looking funny and they're not all nicely and evenly spaced. Okay. All right, but as we predicted on the last slide, that fits that this one's BC, or B cis, and this one's B trans. <laughs> all right, so the splitting fits, how do we determine the coupling constants? So I know some of you have asked this. Um, uh, about your unknowns. How do we determine the coupling constants and how do we determine them in Hertz? Okay. All right. Using top spin, there's a little button on the top. If you look, it says, I think it says HZ and then there's an arrow and then PPM underneath it. If you click that button, it will change all of these values up here from parts per million to Hertz. Okay. If you click that button, now what you do is you get these values in Hertz up here and you simply do a little subtraction and you can figure out what the distance is between each of these peaks. Okay? All right, and so now I actually want to determine the coupling constants. Okay? The distance between the two highest peaks, between the two triplets, that's the big wide coupling. Okay? The center of each triplet is the high part. Okay? And that's the coupling constant. So you measure from this one to that one. Okay? That'll be your big, in this case, the trans coupling. Okay? If you measure between the outside one and so each part of the triplet, that's going to be the coupling constant of the small one. Okay? And you can get that by simply subtracting these values. So you subtract that 2819 and the 2803 there. You subtract those two and you end up with 15.7 hertz is the width of the coupling constant right here between these two triplets. Okay? If I see a coupling constant of 15.7, is that a cis or a trans double bond? It's trans. We're going to squarely right in the middle of that trans. So it, without a doubt, this is about the third confirmation that yes, we have the trans there. It's the trans Okay. All right. The other one, if I subtract the outside one from the next one, that gives us 6.8 hertz. And so that triplet then, the coupling constant of the triplet part is 6.8 hertz. Okay. All right. So the quick little summary for HB trans. You report it as DT. It's a doublet of triplets. Okay, so you have the doublet for the big coupling constant, the triplet for the smaller one. Okay? And the coupling constant is the J equals 15.7 and 6.8 hertz. Okay? And that's how you measure those. Questions on that process? Are there any compounds where it's possible to get more than two constants? Yes, but we won't run into them. Okay? This, is, this is already pretty intense in terms of how complicated they can get. But yeah, they can get, they can get really unbelievably nasty, but we're not going to deal with anything more than this. Okay? Other questions? All right. Now, how do you report that information? OK. Well, before we get to that one, when you determine the coupling constants, especially in this Vidic uh, experiment, it will tell you to go ahead and, and figure those out. And I'll kind of walk you through it a little bit. Go ahead and draw the coupling tree right above the spectrum. OK, so if you draw it like this, you can actually kind of reverse engineer it if you want. But if you kind of expect what it is, and then put it right above it. Okay. We're going to ask you to do that for these alkene protons to actually kind of show us how you determine those values. So be prepared to draw something like this right above the signal. So you'll obviously need to blow up the spectrum and kind of print that out just in that area. Okay. So keep that in mind for both of these two and then for the two I'll show you here in a second. All right, how do you actually report this then? If you, if you get that NMR data table, Okay, the letter, okay, note that you'll have a B trans and a B cis. If you want to put this into two separate tables, you can do that if you want. Otherwise, you can combine them into one table. It's kind of up to you. All right, some of the high points, the chemical shift. Note that you record the chemical shift as the center of the peak. 
Okay, so if you've got kind of six peaks, kind of see what the center of it is. Okay, you can either use the values of the peak picking to figure it out, or you can just kind of estimate it. All right, use the center of the peak, so you only record one value for chemical shift. Okay, okay, the calculated chemical shift. That's what we went through and did at the beginning. You know, predicted what that uh, value was. The literature chemical shift. If you can find this in the literature, I don't remember off the top of my head if it's available or not. Okay, if you find it on say STBS or something, you can put that in this column. All right, the integration from each of these. I haven't talked about integration yet. I'm going to take a step back for a second. Note that the integration is under the peak, OK? One thing to keep in mind, I'll hit on this again in a few minutes. Note that this is a mixture of two compounds. HB trans is this compound. HB cis is this compound, OK? The integrations in this case happen to work out almost perfectly to 2 to 1, but they don't have to. Remember that they're two separate compounds. So in this case, it's like a 66 to 33 mixture of two compounds. It can be you know, 75, 25, it can be 60, 40, it can be whatever. So keep in mind that those two compounds can have very, very different integration values because they can be there in different ratios. Okay? It depends exactly on the way that you purify them and what you combine and so on. Okay? So that's a big thing, you'll run into that and it may be kind of a mind bending issue for a little bit. Okay? But so keep in mind that not all of the integrations of separate compounds will match up nicely. All right. And so when you're recording the integration, okay, re record the value that is shown on your spectrum. So you probably want to normalize one of them to one. That just makes sense. This is probably the smallest of your al like alkene vinyl protons. Put that to one. But then after that, record the value that's there. You only have to record it maybe to tenths or hundredths if you really want to be ambitious. You don't have to record everything. Okay. But be sure you record the value and not what you think it is or what your impression is or under best case circumstance what it would be. Okay? Just be sure you record your number. Okay? Especially on this one, that can really help you out. All right. So the multiplicity then is doublets and triplets. Okay? We talked about that. There's a doublet and a triplet. And then here's the J values that you record off of the spectrum. Okay? Keep in mind that there'll be one J value for each multiplicity that you put here. So if you put a doublet, you're only going to record one J value. If you record a doublet of doublets, then there'll be two J values over here. Okay? And you measure those all off the spectrum. All right. Any questions on this so far? That's a lot of stuff to, to kind of take in. But all right. So the next step, what we're going to do is we're going to look at these HA protons. Okay? I'll kind of give you a little bit of a quicker uh, run through these. Those two are going to be sitting right there. Okay, if we look in, they look like this. In some ways, they're a little bit simpler, and in some ways, they're a little bit more complicated. Okay, so one of them, the trans, is going to be these two over here. Okay, note that there's a big, wide coupling between the two of them. There's that 15.7 hertz coupling that we talked about, the big, wide one. And note that these two are closer together. Okay, so that's the cis coupling that ends up being, in this case, it's, what is that? About 12 or so, 11 and a half or 12. Okay, so it's a little bit more narrow. Okay. All right. Um, and in this case now you can do the same measurements in the same way. So this is what we had predicted for the coupling. Sorry, I have to put it to the side so I don't go right over the top. But you see that there's two small triplets that are quite a distance apart from one another. Okay, and the same thing for the cis, two smaller triplets that are a little bit closer than they are in the trans. Okay. Same idea in terms of determining the coupling constants. You measure the distance between the tops of the triplets and then the distance between the peaks within each triplet. And again, note the relative integration is about 1 to 2, again in this case, because again, we have, in this sample, more of the cis and less of the trans. All right. Okay, and there's the values for that and the values for that. And you can check. They'll be close experimentally. They can vary a little bit, but not a whole lot. They should be pretty close to that. All right. Okay. Any questions so far with the alkenes? Now I'm going to just take you a on a quick spin through everything else in the spectrum real quick. Okay. Right here, okay, at about 3 and 3 quarters, you know, these are 3.7, 3.75. These are the methyl ester peaks. Okay, so here and here. Why do I have two of them? Okay, there's two different compounds, good. Okay, remember, you've got the cis and the trans. They're independent of each other. Okay? They have very, very, you know, slightly different chemical shifts. Okay? So one of these comes from the cis, one of them comes from the trans. How can you tell which one's which? Okay, look at the size. 
Okay, the one that's there in a greater abundance is the one that's going to have the bigger integration. So as you see here, this one's about 2.8, okay, 2.9. This one's like 6.3, okay? So this one on the right belongs to the compound that was there in twice the ratio. From these two, you can't tell which is cis and which is trans, okay? But from that other information of the alkenes that I talked about, you can figure out which one belongs to cis, which one belongs to trans. I'll leave that up to you, okay? If you look at this peaks, now these are down right about 2. These are the peaks that come, right, this CH2 and this CH2, and that CH2 and that CH2, okay? Again, you know, you can figure out a little bit. This is really a pretty nice spectrum where you've got kind of a nice little doublet of quartets there, okay, or quartet of doublets. You can describe it either way you want. This is kind of a big mess in there, and this is kind of an intermediate mess, okay? What happens here is some of these are getting some, there's a little bit of long-range coupling on some of them, and so that can make them a little bit messy. Okay. One thing to note here, you know, why are those integrations so weird? There's four sets of hydrogens to look at. You've got these two in the trans compound and these two in the cis compound. But there's only three sets of peaks here. Why? Okay, there's some that mash together. And it's up to you to figure out which one. But ultimately what you're seeing is you're getting two signals from one compound, two signals from the other compound, and they're doing this. Okay, so they're over the top of each other. So you'll, you can kind of work through to figure it out. Note that the integrations, this is approximately two, this is approximately four, and this is approximately six. So you've got one proton from each of these two that overlap with that. Okay, so you'll get to kind of work through that fun as well. All right. All right, and moving forward, this now here is the aromatic region. So this is that one, uh, the one proton uh, from the trans compound here. But the rest of this here is aromatic, okay? Good luck figuring that out, right? <laughs> okay, you've got two different aromatic peaks. Each of them have, you know, the doublet, the triplet, and the triplet from the ortho and the meta and the para. They all come right over the top of each other, right? About the only thing you can do in this case, oh, and just to make it a little bit more complicated, see that nice little singlet right in the middle? That's chloroform, okay? So even the integration is off based on the chloroform. Okay, so the best you can do is kind of stand back and say, hey, look, I got aromatics in this. That's really about it, okay? If you want to try, what you can do is do an integration on one side and then integrate on the other side and then figure based on the ratios of all your compounds. So if you think back how I integrated one compound to one and the other was approximately two, the one that was integrated to one would have five aromatic protons. The one that was integrated to two would have 10 aromatic protons. So I would figure I would have about 15 total aromatic protons, okay? I have about 16 here, but that's like because I'm also including the chloroform there. So you can kind of break it up and you can try to do that if you want. Like I said, that's, that's yeah, you aren't gonna get anything of any terrible substance out of here, okay? So just pretty much just an issue of how many carbons you have there with integration, okay? When you list that on your peak range, right on your NMR peak table, what you typically do is just go ahead and put multiplet on there on the NMR data table. Okay? It's a multiplet and has a whole bunch of integrations. Okay? And we won't fault you for that. Because you just can't get much out of there. Alright, any questions with that one? Alright. Other items to keep in mind in so the last couple seconds here. Okay? Hopefully you will have a nice, beautiful, clean spectrum like this one. Chances are you're going to have a little bit of something else in there. Some of the common things that can be in there, ether or acetone, right? If you use a pipette that's got a little acetone in it, okay? There's some water. This is West Michigan after all. There's water everywhere, okay? You can get a little bit in your spectrum. You can have some residual chloroform. We've seen that already. You can have some residual ethyl acetate or hexane from your solvent, from your uh, column. All of these things are present, okay? Or they might be present. How do you figure that out? Okay. We have a nifty little resource, and you can't read this right now, okay? but it's, it's up on the Moodle site. We typically have some in the, in the uh, NMR lab, or like the computer labs. Okay? Uh, it, it, this will tell you all of these different impurities. So I don't know if you can see it up here. This is CDCL3 right here. This is a list of common impurities for all of those different things. So if you think you've got a little bit of you know, acetone, you look right here, acetone comes at, what is that, 2.17. Okay, water comes at 1.5. It will tell you where those things are. Use this if you see some peaks that you're not sure what they are and the integration is funky, look at that. All right? With that, just a reminder, 18 and 16 are due this week at the beginning of lab. There's no additional pre-lab. 
Yeah, that's right. I want to hear that cheer. Yes. All right. If you have any questions or anything, come on up. Otherwise, 